أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق أجمعين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون God states in the Quran in the name of God most gracious most merciful O Prophet when my servants ask you about me tell them Truly, I am near. I answer the call of the caller when he calls me. So let them respond to me and believe in me, that they may be led aright. Amanna billah, sadaqallahu al-aliyyul azim. It's been mentioned in the books of tafsir, the exegesis of the Quran, in the commentary of this verse, verse 186 from the second chapter, Surah Al-Baqarah, that a man one day came to the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, and he asked him a question. He said, Ya Rasulullah, where is God? Tell me, where is God? Is God far? Or is God close? The reason why he's asking this question is because he wants to know how to call upon God. If God is close, then we'll whisper. We won't be calling out loud. If God is far, then he'll have to raise his voice. He'll have to call out loud, right? We sort of see this in our daily lives. When we speak to others, if someone's close by, we don't have to raise our voices. If someone's far, we usually raise our voices. Or if we perceive them to be far. That's why sometimes you'll notice that when you're talking on the phone, I see this all the time, right? When you're talking on the phone, uh, or you, have, you, know, so you see someone talking on the phone and they're, and they're on an international call, right? And they're yelling on the phone. They're yelling. And you, know, you don't need to yell. They can hear you, but... The perception is that because that person is far away, I have to call out loud. So the prophet, so the man asked the prophet, where is God? Is God close so that I can whisper when I speak to him, when I call upon him? Or is he far that I can call out loud so that he may hear me? This verse was revealed. God says in the verse, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ This verse tells us two things. One, it tells us that God is close to us. God is close. God is not far. And this is not speaking about physical proximity. It's not a matter of physical proximity. We don't believe that God exists in a physical form, in a physical space, so as to be physically close or far. That does not pertain to God. That does not apply to God, the physical proximity. Here, the discussion is about a metaphysical proximity, a spiritual, if you will, proximity, that God is close to us. And this is why several other verses, they talk about this. They talk about God's proximity to us. For instance, God says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to the human being than حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ which is the jugular vein. Right? This is sort of a metaphor for God's proximity to us. In another verse, God says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِهِ And know that God comes in between the human being, man, and his heart. Again, this is a metaphor, a symbol for 
God's proximity to us, that God is not far, that God is not disinterested, that God is not an entity that has no interest in us, that is not connected to us, that is disconnected from human beings, from the creation. No, absolutely not. God is close to us. This is one thing that the verse tells us. And the other is that it reminds us of the importance of invoking God, of calling upon God, of supplicating to God. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ I answer the call of the one who calls upon me, reminding us of the importance of calling upon God. This is one among many verses in the Quran that reminds us of the importance of dua, of supplicating, of appealing to God, of invoking God in our affairs. Many verses, they encourage us to engage in dua, to supplicate to God, to call upon God at all times, in all situations and circumstances. This is a prominent theme in the Qur'an. Yet, we find that sometimes some questions arise regarding dua, regarding supplication. We find that some have questioned the viability or the effectiveness of dua. Is dua something, is supplication truly effective? Is it something viable in our lives? Some have gone further to reject supplication altogether. They have suggested that we should avoid supplication. It's problematic. They've rejected it all together. And thus we find, and this is an issue that comes up especially in non-religious circles the question of dua encouraging human beings to be passive instead of active right some people say this this thing that we talk about supplicating calling upon god this is highly problematic why because it basically acts as a benumbing force a stupefying force something that encourages human beings to be passive observers rather than active agents, rather than assuming our natural resources or the means at our disposal that we turn to the supernatural. This is an argument that's made, especially in non-religious circles. The dua is, is something that turns us from active agents instead of pursuing natural means to calling upon supernatural entities. In famous phrase attributed to Karl Marx, he once defined religion, he characterized religion as the opiate of the masses. Why? In his understanding, what it did was that it made the masses numb. It disallowed, it prohibited people from being conscious, from recognizing their true place in society and in, in the world. So the argument that's made is that dua, instead of keeping us as active agents, pursuing the things that we need to do, engaging in change in our lives, that we sort of become passive. We call upon a supernatural entity. We call upon another entity, and so we become passive instead of being active. This is one of the arguments that's made. This is one argument. Another argument, this is more within religious circles, is that... Dua is sort of an arrogant attempt to intervene in the affairs of God. Right? God does as God wills. No one can question the will of God. If God wills something, God performs according to God's will. And so to supplicate, to invoke God is sort of like a protest against God's will. It's protesting God's will. And another sort of similar question is, is that it contradicts our obligation to be content and satisfied with God's decree. 
If God has decreed something for us, then we should be satisfied, we should be accepting of God's decree. When we engage in dua, according to this understanding, when we engage in dua, then in fact we are contradicting that obligation to be content with God's decree and we are attempting to intervene in God's affairs. And there are many other questions that are raised, but these are some issues that are raised in regards to dua and supplication. And these questions really are misconceptions about the philosophy, about the essence, about the raison d'etre of dua, of supplication. What dua really is, what supplication really is. Dua does not entail the abandonment of the natural means or resources. In fact, when we come to our teachings, we find that our teachings, the Holy Quran and the tradition of the Prophet and the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all, they encourage us to constantly pursue and to use all of the resources at our disposal. The Quran tells us in fact, to take up means, to use the means at our disposal to arrive at our objectives. The traditions, the ahadith, they remind us that it's important for us to be active in our lives, not to be passive. There's a difference between having tawakkul, dependency on God, and tawakkul. These are two different things. One is having dependency on God, but also engaging in action, pursuing those means that God has given us, that God has bestowed us with in order to arrive and in order to conduct our affairs. And the other is completely passive. We are discouraged in our tradition from not acting, from not using the means uh, that God has given us, the resources that God has given us. In fact, the Quran talks about how even cures to sicknesses, to illnesses, they are found in pursuing certain means. The Quran talks about the healing power of honey, for instance, right? Fihi shifa, that in honey there is healing power. But who is it that heals us? Is it the honey itself or is it God? The Quran reminds us that. It is God who bestows healing, but we are encouraged to pursue certain means and certain ways and certain resources in order to arrive at that healing that comes from God. And so the traditions, the reports, the teachings, they emphasize and they encourage that we have to act. So engaging in dua is not an abandonment, is not an abandonment of Engage or of using our natural means or resources. However, we're also encouraged to recognize that there are certain limits, there are restraints, there are restrictions and confines to our human and natural resources. There's only so much that we can do. As human beings, we're limited. We do not have unlimited power. We do not have unlimited resources. We are limited in many ways. So what dua does, it helps us alleviate the possible despair that might arise when we realize that we are limited. When we realize that we're limited, that my money is not unlimited. My resources, my health, my family, the, the, the resources that I have, they are restricted. This may lead some people to feel a sense of despair because they're not able to engage in certain acts. They're not able to overcome certain challenges despite the resources that they have. This might lead us to a sense of despair. What dua does is that it helps us to overcome the possible despair that arises because we recognize that we are limited. It is through dua that we connect ourselves to the unlimited source. That we 
depend on an unlimited source of all good and all power. Our limited selves become thus dependent and connected on an unlimited source of power. And in fact, we find that dua helps instill hope in our hearts. It energizes us. Many traditions, they talk about the power of hope that is given to us through dua, through prayer, through supplication. And in fact, this is something that has even been confirmed in, in, uh, in scientific studies. If you go certain studies conducted by psychologists, and certain associations, psych psychological associations, they tell us that prayer, that supplication, it helps in certain ways. One of the things that it helps with is it helps to reduce anxiety. Prayer, dua, supplication helps to reduce anxiety. It helps us regulate our emotions. Sometimes our emotions can become overwhelming. And through dua, it helps us to regulate these emotions. It helps us to have a clearer mind. Dua allows us, it increases our self-control. All of these other benefits that are associated with dua that do not make us passive observers, but rather they instill in us energy and hope and strength through this act of dua through supplication. So it's not an abandonment of natural means, but it's a recognition that we are limited and that we have to be in touch, in constant touch with an unlimited source of power and strength, and that is God. And that we invoke God for all of our affairs. Now when it comes to the other questions that come up about, you know, this is an, sort of an intervention in God's affairs, it contradicts our obligation to be content with God's decree and God's will, we find that in fact it is the exact opposite. That the Qur'an and the teachings of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, they encourage us, they command us to invoke upon God. This is a commandment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this verse, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي Let them call upon me. God is commanding us, is encouraging us to call upon God. In another verse, Allah says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ and your Lord said, call upon me, and I will answer your call. There are many beautiful ahadith that talk about how God desires our communication. Very beautiful. They paint for us a picture of a dynamic God who is heavily involved in creation. A God who desires the communication of his servants. That at certain times before Fajr time, when people are usually asleep, when they're resting, that God calls out and that God turns to the angels when someone is engaging, when a person is engaging in an act of worship, is calling upon God, is seeking forgiveness during that time, is conversing with God, that God calls upon the angels and tells the angels, He says, Oh my angels, look at my devout servant who has taken time from his rest. Instead of sleeping, he or she has woken up. They've dedicated some time to call upon me. To call upon me. Some of the ahadith, they tell us that sometimes one of the reasons why God does not always immediately answer our call. Sometimes we engage in dua, we supplicate, we invoke God. 
but we may not necessarily find an immediate response, right? Some of the hadith, they tell us that one of the reasons why we don't receive an immediate response from God is because God desires that we continue to plead. God wants us to continually call upon God because he knows that if he gives us what we want, that's it, khalas, we're going to forget. We're going to go about our business until the next time we're in need, then we're going to take some time again to call upon God. So God wants us to continue to call upon God. God desires our invocation, our calling upon God. And that dua is in fact an opportunity that is given to us by God. Some of the ahadith, they tell us that there are certain things that God will grant us, but God does not grant us until we actually ask God for them. The sixth Imam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says in the hadith, إِنَّ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ مَنْزِلَةً لَا تُنَالُ إِلَّا بِمَسْأَلَةً there are some stations, there, there are some things that with God that are not achieved. They are not acquired unless we ask for them. God wants us to call upon God, to ask God, to invoke God. And thus, we recognize what the essence of dua is. The essence of dua, of supplication, is our wholehearted appeal to God. That we turn to God not just with our voices, not just with our words, but that we turn to God wholeheartedly, from our core, entirely towards God, and we invoke God. This is the essence of dua. And we have many beautiful, one of the unique features of the school of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, is the abundance of supplications, the abundance of du'as that have been transmitted by the Prophet and the Imams and that are available for us. These beautiful du'as, these beautiful supplications that are great in meaning and content. And they are there for us to take advantage of, to read, to learn, to use when we invoke God. We have many beautiful du'as. The month of Ramadan is the month of du'a. In fact, this verse that I began with, verse 186 from chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, comes immediately after the Qur'an introduces the month of Ramadan and the obligation to fast. Immediately. The next verse is this verse. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ The month of Ramadan is the month of du'a. The month in which we turn to God. And while we have this huge treasure trove of beautiful du'as, the ahadith, they tell us that the best du'a is the du'a that comes out spontaneously from our hearts and from within. You know, sometimes we think that if we want to call upon God, if we want to speak to God, we have to do so in a very formulaic way. It's a mathematical way. Right? You have to do step one, and then step two, and then step three. And that's the only way that God will listen to us. But this is not the case. The doors of God are always open. And God listens to us. And the ahadith, they tell us that the best dua is the one that comes from the bottom of our hearts with sincerity and can be spontaneous. God hears all voices. God understands all languages and all dialects. And so it's up to us to turn to God and to speak to God, to invoke God, to call upon God for all of our affairs. And this is not just when we're facing difficulty. We need to be able to establish a relationship with God whereby we're calling upon God at all times, in all circumstances. Yes. Many of us, when we're facing difficulties, when we're facing issues that we usually have no power or control over, we spend the most time and effort calling upon God. And that makes sense, obviously, right? The point of dua is that 
we as limited beings call upon the unlimited power of God, the unlimited mercy and compassion of God to overcome our affairs. But we should be calling upon God at all times, in all places, for all affairs, that we maintain this relationship with God. And finally, brothers and sisters, there are certain hadith, the teachings, they tell us that there are certain prerequisites for us to guarantee that God accepts our du'as and supplications. Because sometimes we, again, like I mentioned, we call upon God, we pray, but some of our du'a is not always answered in the way that we assume or in the way that we would like or desire. First of all, one thing to note is that God always listens to our du'a. God always accepts our supplication. But the way that God answers may not necessarily be the way that I expect God to answer. There's a theological principle that we believe in. And that is that God is not all wise, but God is also not just all wise, but God is also all benevolent. That God functions in a way that is best for God's creation. And God is aware of that which is best for us. God knows those things that are advantageous to us and those things that are disadvantageous to us. It's sort of like parents. You know, it's a, it's a very simple example. But the example of parents and how they deal with their children. Sometimes children, especially younger children, but even older children sometimes, they may not necessarily understand their parents' decisions. But every parent, or generally, parents in general, they function for the betterment and for the goodness of their child. This is generally the case. The, the parent wants the best for his or her child. Even if the child does not understand, the child might call upon their parents and you know, nag and say, you know, I want ice cream, I want candy, I want this, I want that. Sometimes the parent gives, sometimes the parent withholds. But in both cases, it's for the goodness of the child. The parent is looking to give the child the best that the child can have. And God, as the master and lord and creator and sustainer of this universe and everything within, functions the same way, with benevolence, with kindness. And this is why we recite in Dua al iftitah during the month of Ramadan, we recite, وَلَعَلَّ الَّذِي أَبْطَأَ عَنِّي هُوَ خَيْرٌ لِي and perhaps it is that which is delayed. That supplication, that dua, that call that I have made, that request that I have made to you, it has been delayed, its answer has been delayed. Why? Because you are aware of the final outcome. You are aware that it is in my best interest for it to be delayed. But there are some traditions, they tell us there are some points, prerequisites to guaranteeing that our du'as are answered. And I'll go through them very quickly. One of them, brothers and sisters, is that we, we are encouraged to engage in du'a with purity of the soul. One of the prerequisites for our du'as to be accepted by God, answered by God, is when we maintain purity of the soul. Meaning that we have to work towards cleansing our souls, purifying our souls, seeking forgiveness. Some of the things that we engage in, the behavior that we engage in, it might put a limit, it might block our du'as from being accepted from being heard, from going to God, from being accepted by God. We recite this in Dua Kumayn, Allahumma khfir li ad-dunub allati tahbisu dua O my Lord, forgive those sins, those acts that block dua. And so we are encouraged to engage in the purification of our souls, to seek forgiveness, to ensure that our souls are pure and this is one way of guaranteeing that our dua 
is accepted. Another is to ensure the purity not just of our souls, but of our bodies and our lifestyle, of our belongings. Many du'as, they tell us that one reason why our prayers or supplications may not be accepted is if we consume things that are haram. The traditions tell us that if we consume haram food or haram income, this acts as a barrier from our du'a being accepted. There's a tradition narrated where Moses, peace be upon him, one day he's walking and he sees a man on the floor. And the man is crying, he's weeping, and he's calling upon God. And so Moses feels bad for him. He turns to him and he says, you know, what is it? Explain to me what's going on. The man turns to him and he says, I've been calling upon God for God to accept, you know, this supplication of mine, to answer this call of mine. But God has not accepted my call. So Moses, he asks God. He says, oh my Lord, the servant of yours is sitting here and he's, you know, he's crying, he's weeping. Why is it that you're not answering his call? God replies to Moses. He tells him, oh Moses, do not see his state apparently. This man, his whole life is consumed, is filled with the consumption of haram. The food that he eats is, is haram. The clothing that he's wearing, the home that he has acquired, the income that he has acquired, it's all haram. We have to be able to purify our, not just our souls, but our bodies and our belongings and our lifestyles. This is a second. The third is that we have to be able to engage in observing our personal and social responsibilities. One hadith here tells us that if a society arrives at a point where it disregards not just its, the individual members' you know, personal responsibilities, but their social, their communal responsibilities, encouraging others towards good, discouraging them from immorality, helping one another, aiding one another, supporting one another, that one of the consequences of such a society is that when they call upon God, God will not answer them because they've abandoned their responsibility towards one another. Because their responsibility is not just between them and God. They have a responsibility towards God's creation, towards their neighbors, towards their family members, towards their community members, towards strangers. They have a responsibility. And one consequence of neglecting our responsibility towards others, being selfish, just thinking about ourselves, is that our dua is not acceptable, it's not heard. And finally, the traditions, they tell us that one of the beautiful supplements to a dua should be that it begins with God's praise, that we praise God, and that it also includes a prayer praising the Prophet and the household of the Prophet. Allahumma <laughs> salli to include with the dua a salawat. This is one of the important aspects of a dua. And there's a very beautiful hadith here. The Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, he says that any time you make a supplication, you call upon God for a personal request, make sure that you also include with it a prayer, a praise of the Prophet and the family, because this is also a prayer when we perform the salawat, we are performing a prayer. We are asking God to bless the Prophet and the family. That when you pray for yourself, also include this prayer, this praise for the Prophet and the family. Because, because God is greater, is kinder than to receive two du'as. Two du'as together and to only accept one of them. The salawat is always accepted. Anytime we send praise upon the Prophet and the family of the Prophet, that's always accepted by God. God is greater and more kind than to accept only one of those supplications and not the other. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, again, this is the month, the holy month of Ramadan. 
the month of mercy, the month of compassion, the month of the Qur'an, the month of dua. This is a time like no other. The best of days and the best of nights and the best of hours and the best of minutes. A time that we take advantage of in calling upon God, in seeking God's mercy and forgiveness upon us, in invoking God for our hajat, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, the most compassionate, the most merciful, to accept our prayers, to accept our supplications, our fasting, and our deeds during this holy month. We pray to Allah to forgive our sins and our shortcomings, to grant us all that which is good in this month. We pray to Allah to bestow His peace upon those who are suffering, those who are ill, those who are living in poverty and war across the globe. And we pray to Allah, the most merciful, to bestow his peace upon the souls of those who have passed away and to hasten the reappearance of our final Imam. وَإِلَىٰ أَرْوَاحِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ نُهْدِي جَمِيعًا ثَوَابَ سُورَةِ الْفَاتِحَ مَعَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ مُحَمَّدٍ